Before we start talking about higher order differential equations, I want to talk about where we've come so far. First of all, we know what a differential equation is. We know there's ODEs and PDEs. We've learned what an IVP, or an initial value problem, is. We know how to verify a solution. We know some types of physical phenomena that can be modeled by differential equations. We also know how to draw solution curves without an actual solution. And then we also learned how to solve some first order differential equations. We learned about separable equations. We learned about linear equations. That was when we used the integration factor. We also learned about exact equations. And we talked about different substitution methods, homogeneous as well as Bernoulli. Now we're going to talk about higher order differential equations. Before we do that, a little bit of algebra review. If I gave you a problem like this, this is where x is to the first power. I get exactly one answer. I get that x is equal to 3 halves. This, however, is a quadratic equation. I could solve it a number of ways. This one is factorable, and I would get two solutions for this. Where am I going with this? Well, if I have a first order differential equation, I got one answer. If, however, I have a second order differential equation, I'll end up with two solutions. And it's going to model a lot what we did in terms of algebra with quadratics. For instance, if I gave you this equation, we would come up with one solution. Actually, it's not one solution, it's a repeated solution. In differential equations, a repeated solution is a little bit more difficult than it is in terms of basic algebra. And then I could have something like this, where I'd end up with complex solutions. So I have two real, I have a repeated real, and then I have imaginary. When we're solving differential equations that are second order, we're going to have, just like we did with quadratics, we're going to have three different types of solutions. So now we're going to talk about what's called a fundamental set of solutions. Here's a second order differential equation. This is linear, and it's also homogeneous. Again, when I talked about that substitution method, I said I would pronounce that word homogeneous. It's the same word, but it means two different things. In this case, it's when the right-hand side of the equation, that is what normally is the gx, is equal to zero. That is, there is nothing that does not have the dependent variable. This would not be homogeneous. y1 and y2 are two solutions to this differential equation. Let's go ahead and prove that. As before, I would take the first and the second derivative, and now I'm going to plug it back into my original differential equation. And I see it works for y1, and it also works for y2. So both y1 and y2 are solutions of this differential equation. However, what we're going to do now is build what we call a fundamental set of solutions. That is, the solution yx is equal to some constant c1 times the first solution, y1, plus c2 times the second solution, y2. This is called the superposition principle. I'm not going to prove this, but I'm going to show how this is true for the example I just gave. So here's my y, my y prime, and my y double prime. I'm going to plug that back into my original differential equation, and I think you can see that that is in fact a true statement. Again, this is not a proof, but it does show in our simple example how the superposition principle works. I'm going to be a little more specific here. I can say that this solution y, which is equal to c1y1 plus c2y2, is in fact the general solution if y1 and y2 are linearly independent. What does that mean? That means that one can't be a constant multiple of the other. Sometimes it's really easy to figure out whether or not two solutions are dependent. For instance, y1 is simply 6 times y2, so that's why these two are dependent. That is, they could not create a general solution for a differential equation. However, this set of three solutions isn't as straightforward. I can write y2 in terms of y1 and 5 times y3, so these three are also dependent. So if I have a group of solutions, c1y1 plus c2y2 all the way to cnyn, and that equals 0, if it's true that you can come up with a relationship between y1, y2 through yn such that all the c's are not 0, then they're actually linearly dependent, just like I have in the example above, y2 was equal to y1 plus 5 times y3. That doesn't seem to help me too much, except now I'm going to turn to a tool called the Ronskian. And before I tell you what the Ronskian is, I'm going to tell you how we're going to use it. 
solutions y1 through yn are linearly independent if and only if the Ronskian of all of those solutions is not equal to zero. And I'm not going to go into the proof of this, but there are some very good references online. For instance, Paul's online notes. It does an excellent job of going through the proof of this, but I'm just going to show you how to use it. The Ronskian is simply the determinant of this matrix. Y1, Y2, Y3 in the first row, and then the derivatives of those functions, and then the second derivative of those functions. If we had five solutions, we would have five rows in addition to the five columns. For this class on exams, you're only going to have to deal with a two by two matrix. This is not a linear algebra course, so I'm not expecting you to be able to handle a three by three determinant. So let's just look at our two by two determinant. This is simply equal to the main diagonal minus the minor diagonal. And if that is not equal to zero, then they are independent. If they are equal to zero, that means they are dependent. Let's look at an example. This is similar to what I've done before. In this case, k is equal to one. When I calculate the Ronskian, I see that it does not equal zero, so these are in fact independent solutions. So this would constitute a general solution. Let's look at this. Let's look at this example. When I take the first derivatives, this is what I get. Now when I calculate the Ronskian, we see that equals zero. And I can think of this in terms of my exponent rules. And I think it's easy to see now that y2 can be represented as a constant multiple 36 times y1. But using the Ronskian is usually easier than trying to guess the constants. 